Hi there, and welcome to this month's episode of Beyond the Photo with me, Damien Jackson. This month we're at Hookhead Lighthouse in County Wexford. Hookhead is one of the oldest operational lighthouses in the world. We'll be looking at its background, its history, and of course some spots for getting the best compositions for your photography. We'll be also looking at the different angles of lighting so that if you do decide to visit you get the best out of your journey. So thank you once again for joining me and let's get going. Travelling to the Hook from Watford, Tremor or anywhere along the southern coast is generally made easier by using the Passages Car Ferry. It takes about 40 or 50 minutes off the travel time and the cost is 12 euros return. The ferry crosses Watford Estuary and Watford City and Port are upriver to the north or on my left as I cross the river and my destination is downriver to the mouth of the estuary or the south or on my right as I cross to the village of Ballyhack on the Wexford side of the river. The last couple of kilometres to Hookhead are very picturesque with the estuary on your right and the village of Dunmore East, County Waterford visible on the opposite side. If you haven't been to the lighthouse previously it's only when you get up close you realise that this is the big one, the granddaddy of the lighthouses. Parking is available on the grassy banks overlooking the sea on the right. It's very convenient as you can drive all the way to within a few metres of the lighthouse. You can also park a camper van here overnight, so it's handy for a sunset shoot followed by astro and sunrise the next morning. Now I don't own a camper van, but luckily my Nissan X-Trail does the job. With just enough room with the seats folded down to fit an airbed, a sleeping bag, coolie box, cooker and of course the essential camera gear. Hookhead Lighthouse stands at the eastern entrance to Watford Harbour, where the three sister rivers of the Shore, the Nore and the Barrow flow into the sea. The existing tower was built in 1172 by Strongbow's son-in-law William Marshall, Earl of Pembroke although it is thought that there may have been a beacon there stretching right back to the 5th century. As of 2020, it is 848 years old, making it one of the oldest operational lighthouses in the world. The lighthouse stands at 36 metres high, and its walls are an unbelievably 4 metres thick in some places. The tower was constructed of local limestone, and the original building still stands today. The wider tier on the bottom and the narrower top section are connected with a stairway of 115 steps. The first tier has three storeys, is 13 metres in diameter with the original fireplaces still in place. The top section is 6 metres in diameter and this originally supported the beacon fire and in later years the lantern. William Marshall succeeded Strongbow as Lord of Leinster and had established a port in the town of New Ross almost 30 kilometres further upriver. He built the tower to assist in navigation and keep ships safe as they sailed up to New Ross. In the early days it was a group of monks that helped in the construction, looked after the tower and lit fires to warm mariners of the dangerous rocks that surround the peninsula. The monks served at the tower until around the mid 1600s when the first lighthouse keepers took over. In the 1860s Three houses were built at the site for the lighthouse keepers and these were turned into a visitor centre and the lighthouse to open to the public in 2001. In terms of the light or lantern, a coal burning lantern was installed in 1671 which replaced the old beacon fire and this served for 120 years until in 1791 a whale oil lantern over 4 metres in diameter consisting of 12 different lamps was installed. This whale oil lantern lasted another 80 years until it was replaced by gas in 1871 and by paraffin oil in 1911. 1911 also saw the change from a constant to a flashing light which worked on a clockwork mechanism 
that required winding up every 25 minutes by the lighthouse keeper on duty. It wasn't until relatively recent, in 1972, that electricity became the source of power for the lantern. And finally, in 1996, the lighthouse became automated and controlled from Dunleary, and the last of the lighthouse keepers left their post. So let's head to a couple of locations I'll be going to for sunrise in the morning. It'll be dark at that stage, so best to show you around here first. From the lighthouse, walk or drive back the road for about 200 metres and you'll see a small square building on the left. I think it's an old lime kiln. About 50 metres after that, there's a gap in the grass bank and you can drive into a small parking area. Once you've parked the car, walk over the grassy bank and onto the rocks. Turn to your left and you're looking at the first composition. There's no need to go any further for this one. Use the rocks and the sea as your foreground and depending on sea conditions and light, this is a great spot for shooting the lighthouse. For the second composition, I'm going to climb down the rocks that I was using as my foreground in the first composition. What I'm trying to achieve here is to catch some small waves breaking over the rocks and use those as a foreground. A disclaimer here is that this is only possible during relatively calm conditions, but you still need to be on your guard always. So those are two suggestions for compositions on the western side of the lighthouse. So let's go now and take a look at the eastern side. So one of the ways to get around to the other side of the lighthouse is actually just to come up to the cliffs and there's a little pathway as you can see in front of me that um, you can walk over the rocks and walk along the lighthouse. Now there is a, an easier route at the other side through um, a barley field or a cornfield etc. You can go up the side wall. Now the gate is normally locked and there's a sign up no trespassing etc but I have seen other people going up it but I'm going to go this way because the, there's no issue with it. So once you get around the rocks on the other side of the lighthouse you'll pick up the pathway again and it'll bring you along a, a lovely cliff walk actually well in good weather a lovely cliff walk and um, there's a number of spots you can pick out from there for your compositions and we'll have a look at those now in a couple of minutes so for the first composition on the eastern side of the hook um, we're going to walk up the cliff pathway until you're about 20 meters from the ring boy you can see there that's the first ring boy that's along the cliffs and as you can see it's very easy from here to get down and walk onto the rocks it's often a better idea if you're shooting into the sun to make sure that there's either some cloud cover or the sun is just about going uh, behind the horizon otherwise you're going to get a lot of flare in that if you're shooting directly into the sun So this is the area for the first composition. We're up on the high. We're going to use the sea in the foreground. And then you have the rocks of the cliffs kind of curving around to the right um, to give us a nice little leading line into it. Now again, you can go a little bit further out. And shoot a little bit back inwards. And from here, there's a really nice composition. Again, you probably need a little bit wider le angle lens. You're looking at probably 16 on, on a full frame or maybe 10 on a, a crop sensor. 
So the second composition drops down a height and it almost gets down to sea level. And you can see the way the sea is flowing over the rocks there. Now down there you do need to have your wits about you and you do need to be fairly sure footed. So, you know, if the legs aren't great, I wouldn't advise going down here. It can be quite slippy and you all always need to watch out for rogue waves that are going to come in. But you will get a nice composition from there and we'll see if we can get down there now and have a look. So this is the second composition from the eastern side. Um, I will reinforce that you do need to have your wits about you and you do need to be somewhat sure-footed coming down here. But it is a nice composition. The water comes in, you're a lot lower at this stage. The water comes in in front of you. Um, the waves go up onto the rocks and if you can get them when they're retreating and just you get some lovely patterns with the flow. Now again, the tide is pretty much in. You can get out further and shoot actually backwards towards the land um, when the tide is further out. But at the moment, it's pretty much in. So after all the sussing out of compositions, it was time to kick back, cook up the grub, and wait for sunset. So as Murphy's Law would have it, by the time sunset came around, the wind had dropped, the tide had gone out, but perhaps the day would be saved by a splash of colour in the sky. So I'm happy enough with this one. It's a pity there wasn't more action in the sea, but the colours in the sky are nice, and I just love the way the um, colours on the cliffs, the yellows in the cliffs have come out, and they contrast the blues in the water and, and in the sky as well. Given that the sea was so calm, I decided to stay where I was and not bother going down to the lower location. I could go back there in the morning. I stayed in the same position, waited for it to get almost dark and took another few images. Here's my favourite from that late night shoot. I desaturated this one in post-production and I just love the way the rocks can be seen under the sea because of the long exposure. So after all of that, it was back to my four-star accommodation, a couple of bottles of beer and straight into the bed. So at 4.30 the alarm went off, got up, had a quick coffee from the flask and drove the 200 metres down past the lime kiln to the little spot that I showed you earlier in the video. I have to admit now it wasn't very promising. It was a lot of cloud cover and a bit of haze around and I didn't have much hope but you look, uh, I said hope anyway. So nothing spectacular happened, but there was, um, there was a little slit of um, colour right along the horizon and then further up into the sky there was just a little bit of colour coming from the clouds. There was a nice little bit of wave action happening on the rocks down below me. So rather than smooth the whole thing, I decided I'd um, go for a little bit of action and went for one sixth of a second. With a little bit of help from Lightroom in post-processing, here's the finished image. It's okay, you know, it, it's nice to take something away from a shoot and uh, while it's nothing spectacular, you can't beat the, the power of a raw file that you, you know, you can pull these extra little colors out of it and um, just add the texture and a bit, little bit of clarity to the rocks and it makes a difference. So after that I decided to climb down to the rocks down below me. What I had in mind was a shot um, keeping the camera low to the ground, quite close to the wave but obviously not close enough that it was going to get wet or washed in etc. 
and try to use uh, a wave splashing over the rocks as the foreground. Now it's not an exact science because you've obviously no idea what way the wave is going to break or what way the splash is going to occur etc. So between this and the next image I took about 150 perhaps even 200 shots at each wave that came in and broke just hoping that one of them would have the right splash. So this one is just after the wave has broken and the water is retreating and I like the nice striations of water flowing down the rock as it's cascading down and going back into the sea after it. If you're new to this type of photography and trying to get the same effect, I find the best um, shutter speed is around 1 6th or 1 8th of a second. That'll give you that energy still within the water without smoothing everything out. Following that series of shots, I decided I'd head over to the eastern side of the lighthouse and go down to the rocks that I didn't get to on the night before and hopefully get something while there was still a small bit of colour left in the sky. Now as you can see the tide is a good bit out at this stage which lets me get right down and out and look back towards the lighthouse. What I'm trying to do is use this rock here in the foreground so when the water washes over it I'm going to try and catch it cascading back down into the sea. All the time I was fighting a losing battle against the sky. I was hoping for that glimmer of light and that's purely all I got, a bare glimmer. The other element that I'm disappointed with here is that the rock I was using in the foreground isn't high enough up out of the water so I'm losing a lot of the cascade effect. I also think by using a quarter of a second it might be just that little bit long and I lost that definition in whatever flow was there. I had a look around for another spot and decided to move to my right and a little bit to the rear and try and get another rock with that was maybe a little bit more prominent and I could get some nice cascades uh, coming down from it once the tide was sweeping out. But this is the last one from the sunrise sunset shoot. I'm happy enough with this one. Um, the sky certainly clouded over but there was still detail there and, and that makes it nice. I love the way the um, water is cascading down the rock. The only thing I'm not sure about is the rock on the left hand side. I think it might look better if that wasn't there but look let me know what you think in the comments. An hour or so later the sky opened up and it turned out to be a beautiful but windy day. So that's it from me at Hookhead Lighthouse. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video and if you did please leave a like or a comment below. If you'd like to subscribe you'll be notified of my next video. The next episode will be of a road trip to Donegal and Mayo and it would be great if you could join me along the journey for that. So once again thank you for watching, bye for now and stay safe.